Hello and welcome to Collapse Club, where we ask the question, how are we to live in the time of collapse? I'm David Baum in Seattle. With me today is Andrew Constantino, also in Seattle. Hello, Andrew. Hey, David. How's it going? Okay. Thanks for coming back. Two weeks ago, you were on and we started talking about a concept of yours called the lie. The lie. What is the <laughs> lie, Andrew? What are you talking about? Um, yeah, I had fun talking about it before. Uh, there's definitely a lot more elements to it. And I would say the lie is, you know, we could see it as society or our culture. Um, you know, the, the, the simulation, some people have, have called it. Maybe we're in a computer simulation. I, I see it as it's a social simulation. It's not technological, um, but it is the falseness that surrounds us that creates like the buffer or the padding that makes it so we accept, um, you know, the collapse that is happening just underneath the surface. It almost sounds like a good thing. It almost sounds like a tool for like keeping it going in the face of terrible circumstances. Do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? Well, that's, that's an interesting way to look at it. I, I think that if it were to be completely ripped off and revealed, um, it would be horrifying. You know, I, I mean, I am blind to much of it myself. You know, I don't claim to pierce right through it. Um, so I think that it is good in that it can create like enough mental space or emotional, uh, you know, stability that we can maybe begin to address it piece by piece. But it has human costs. Last time you were talking about uh, Disney World and the people who play Cinderella and who play Mickey Mouse, but the woman who plays Cinderella is living in her car and the guy in the Mickey Mouse costume can't afford health care for his kids. So uh, the lie hurts people, right? Oh, for sure. And, and I think that, you know, the real problem, you know, whether that manifests itself as just like a general politeness or turning a blind eye to, you know, the struggles our world faces, or it's, you know, indulging yourself in celebrity gossip or political sportsmanship, you know, like your team versus their team. All of it makes it so um, things rot from within and they go unaddressed because we're busy in ourselves with these other things. So it's a mechanism for denial then. Uh, yeah, that I think that that is the best way to describe it. It, it, is, it is a um, collective denial. And what are we busy denying? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, it is the, the scale of, I, I wouldn't even just say human, but primarily human suffering. Um, but it also affects, you know, the whole world, uh, you know, all living things in it, as well as our natural environment that we allow things to spiral completely out of control. And, you know, part of the lie is pretending that we're in control. Okay, but the lie is not something that just happens to us. You said uh, emphatically that you yourself are a purveyor of the lie. What do you, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I, I, I am for sure. And, and, and I mean, so it almost sounds like, well, all are sinners, you know, but I don't necessarily mean it like that. I, I mean that you can't emerge from it, you know, like I was born here in America, I'm indoctrinated with it. Um, and so, you know, I mean, it, it saturates every part of your being, you know. Um, so, of course, you know, I, I participate in it. Um, I think that I, it's almost even worse that I consider myself to be one of the oracles of the lie. And, and what I mean by that is I, I feel like there's almost like a priesthood of oracles. And these are the interpreters of the lie. 
And so even me talking now, like what I'm saying right now, I'm interpreting the lie. And so I would say like um, a stockbroker is an oracle of the lie. You know, people in pre literal pe priesthood are oracles of the lie. It is all the consultants and analysts um, and the people that predict the future, right? And so I'm doing that in my particular flavor or brand is critiquing the lie, whereas their brand may be directly upholding it or shaping it into a different point of view. But it is possible, is it not, to free oneself? Uh, is, it, it, is the search for wisdom, the search for truth, uh, the search for authentic meaning, is that impossible? In, in this context? No. Uh, and I do think that, you know, like this is not a political thing, you know, like we kind of alluded to before in our last conversation, you know, often we see it as that team sport, our team versus their team. Um, I think that that's just part of it as well. Um, I think that the panacea to it, um, which is kind of an ironic term because it's a medicine that doesn't exist, is like honesty um, authenticity and accountability. And, and so I do feel like, you know, like today, there are people, you know, some of the people that I've heard speak on your show um, that basically are dropping out of the lie. And so you can do that. It, it's, it would be difficult to achieve it, um, but you can get pretty separated from it. But say us living in this huge city, Seattle, um, even if I were to drop out, it doesn't mean that the play doesn't continue. Just because one actor breaks character doesn't mean the other actors stop. The show must go on. <laughs> yeah, the show must go on. <laughs> and and they're, never... probably, they're probably going to not want to be around you. You know, your understudy will take your place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Your metaphor uh, regarding Disney World uh, and the uh, people wearing masks under which their personal misery is concealed really spoke to me for some reason. It makes me think that we in general wear masks, which are our social personas, uh, the person that we present to the world in order to get along with other people, in order to make a living, in order not to be carted off to the insane asylum. Uh, we're all sort of forced to wear masks which imprison us. Do you think that's true? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, when I really think about it, um, you know, Andrew, you know, and some of my friends have heard me describe it as this, that Andrew with, you know, I actively, take steps to dye my hair or to like dress in some distinct like punk rock kind of way. Um, Andrew is a character, you know, that I actively choose to put on. And even some of the personality traits like being a doomsayer or kind of having like this sarcastic humor, you know, those are parts of the costume too, you know? And, you know, I play that part or, you know, it's like a vehicle that I interact with the world through. And um, I would say that it has its uses, you know, um, like if we looked at, you, you know, I, I think, what do I know? You know, I, I'm no mystic, but I believe like in Buddhism or whatever, we could look at our physical form as kind of like I'm reaching through um, the veil, and this is like a puppet that my spirit operates. But I think like in a more uh, materialistic sense, uh, you know, physical reality, that Andrew the character is the puppet through which I interact with society. You're aware of that. Uh, yeah. You're aware that you are taking on a, a character and you use it for your purposes I think a lot of people are not aware that the person that they think they are is a character. But you know what? I mean, 
it, there are things, like I said, that I'm blind to that I hadn't really considered. That would be one of them because I, I really think that, you know, like some of the conclusion the last time we spoke was, you know, waking up to this is, you know, a good first step. And, and I do think that waking up to it and realizing that, um, you know, the things that I prefer, you know, I, I like vanilla more than chocolate or I like this band more than that band it, it's like it is so incredibly meaningless you know and uh, my emotional mental energy my physical labor um, is meant to support and to serve and uplift others you know not to garner um, all my you know preferences together to indulge in you're talking it's hard to put my finger on <laughs> so it's possible to be playing the role that one plays to adopt a character and still be a good person still be a good force in the world uh artificiality or constructedness is not a barrier to goodness is what oh, you're oh, saying yeah well, I mean, we could look at it, um, it it's, we could create something, you know, like a, a mechanical thing, like a vehicle, um, and that vehicle could be used for good purpose, or it could be used to exploit and harm other people. And, and so I think that even like our socio-emotional constructs of, our, of who we are, um, are that vehicle as well, um, that it, it is our minds and our spirits that are creating these things and we could turn it into a weapon of war that hurts and harms other living things, or it can be an agent of peace. And you've made the choice to be an agent of peace. how did that come about in your life? Oh, it took me a long time, you know, uh, a little older than I look, I'm going to be 47 soon. And so for me, I really feel like even though there were like signs, even though like I heard the call, you know, to like a path of peace and love um, many times in my life, I didn't answer that call until probably about six years ago or so. And really for me, it, it was one individual who I did not know um, who I was so negative towards. And I mean, I won't get into all the details, but I feel like I was just emotionally mistreated this person who, you know, we had no real connection, but it seemed like they were reaching out to me and that person ended up um, overdosing and dying. Um, and though I don't hold my res myself responsible for their death, what, what I realized was um, my negativity my, the static that I gave this person anytime they kind of reach out to me, I don't want to be the person that contributes to the suffering of others. Um, I don't want to be that person. And I am going to devote myself to never being that person and to be someone else. <laughs> well, what can I say? Bless you for that. I'm reflecting yeah. it. I'm reflecting in this moment that uh, it has never been, I'm thinking about the ancestors. Uh, some of the talk around the question of collapse gets into one's relations with one's ancestors or the ancestors. Um, I haven't really uh, taken part in that too much. My, my family is a sad story, very much dissolute, you know, evaporated into the, past. Um, but one legacy that I did collect and keep is has always been public service and kindness. I don't give myself stars for that. I'm just noting that my dad was big mm -hmm. into that and mom, God bless her as well. Um, and it, I always knew that I needed to be doing something, but it's taken a very long time to reconcile you know, the less controlled parts of my personality, <clears throat> excuse me, with the 
purpose of mission of really trying to do good in the world. I think it takes a while to get yourself under control so you can be effective at your chosen path. No, I agree with that completely. And, and, and I think that, um, I, you know, one thing I think we've talked about before is I don't think that there are any permanent solutions. You know, I, I think that life um, is just ever changing and that it's a good thing that we don't, if we could just invent perfect philosophies or politics or societies, then we would just completely deny other generations um, the chance for emotional growth that only comes through failure. You know, th there is a wisdom that can only be gleaned by making mistakes. And so we don't want to have construct, construct things that uh, prevent people from, you know, failing, from making mistakes. It, it, it's even when it comes to like the safety or health of others, you know, we have to be able to fail in order for our lives to have meaning. And that's why I really feel like, you know, like currently, you know, with the, the state of the world, I think a lot of people of conscience feel this way, um, that there's something deeply wrong. Um, but personally, I, I welcome this apocalypse um, because it is a chance for us to live up to our true calling, you know, as a species and as a world. Well, I agree that the current dire crisis forces us to confront the truth as opposed to the lie, but <laughs> the people are squirming with great energy to sort of hang on to whatever story it is they happen to be familiar with and comfortable with, myself included. I don't put myself above that. But if you look out into, into the world, people are either trying to cling to business as usual, or interestingly, they are trying to confront the crisis using the same stories that we have been using for tens or hundreds of years and which have failed abjectly. The question is, what are the new stories? What are the new approaches that might, <clears throat> might get to the, the real core of what's happening here? Yeah. And, and you know, it just makes me think that, um, you know, it, it, with the emergence, it, it feels like it's been three or four years, but it's probably been more like 20, 30 years of the data, right? Data, data, data. I hear that word in my work every single day about everything. And I, I just always wonder, so how's that working out so far? You know, how many problems has the data solved yet? You know, it, it, is it getting us any closer to anything of, you know, like a humanitarian, um, dignified life and world? Uh, sure doesn't feel that way. And I, I'm positive that the data will all work out, you know, next year, or five years. Um, but I, I look at it like, you know, I, I'm not saying that knowledge is useless. I, I'm saying that it serves its master, right? And if its master doesn't have a conscience, if its master isn't about other living things, um, then it's serving evil. Um, and I, I look at it, you know, like the Disneyland metaphor that, um, there's another metaphor that, you know, is colorful and fun that it seemed like it made sense uh, when Wizard of Oz came out that, oh, it's this great and powerful being, this authoritarian figure who has power and has all the answers and can solve every problem. And then they pull back the curtain and it's a, a charlatan who doesn't know what he's doing. But I feel like if we pull back the curtain now, there isn't even the charlatan. I, I think there's nothing there. Um, and that the oracles, you know, listen to the wizard. Um, they interpret his words and his commands. We go to them for answers. But I feel like it, it's empty, that the throne is empty right now. There is no decider. There is no authority any longer. And that is really why we feel lost. There's only interpretations 
like data of the lie. There is any, there is no liar. Wow. <laughs> that, okay. That is really deep. That is like seriously deep. And I find it terrifying to think, Me too. yeah, <laughs> that there's no one on the throne. I mean, not that you want some old white guy on the throne judging the world, like the usual metaphor of God, not that you want that, but the idea that the throne is empty, that's a portent of like chaos in the most primeval sort of interpretation. And that's a little scary. Uh, and and I, it scares me too. And, and that's why we were saying at the start that I, I just feel like if the lie was shattered and all was revealed, that that's what scares me. It is that no one has the answer. Um, I, I think that the, the way to not like be overwhelmed with panic about feeling that way though, is, you know, like I said, you're talking to a lot of people of conscience that are really thinking about these things and that, it isn't about Andrew knowing what we should do or knowing the answer. It is about a community of people that are willing to listen and collaborate and create what seems to be the answer. And, and it isn't perfect and it isn't forever. And I think that's an ongoing conversation and collaboration and working together, um, you know, to make a world that is safe and dignified for all. And with the knowledge that we cannot create a golden temple that stands for 10,000 years, that, that shouldn't be our goal. Well, that's very interesting. The recently deceased uh, Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh said at one point, maybe the next Buddha is not a person but is a community. And I hear you saying that maybe in the work of yeah. communities, um, something to replace the lie can take form and, and grow and live. Yeah, I, I love that. You know, it, it's like uh, Martin Luther King and beloved community. I, I really think that that is um, the new God um, or the new um person that needs to sit on the throne, the new ideal that needs to sit on the throne. It isn't about a flag and it isn't about an ideology. Um, you know, it is about a mutual commitment to the well-being of all. And, and I think that's what's missing, right? That's why everything feels so hollow. Um, everything feels like it's a dead end. It, you know, I, I have this feeling you know, it's uh, the other thing I, I'm always thinking about as like a good example of the lie is like the whole cryptocurrency NFT thing, which just seems like, hey, let's completely take the leash off the most predatory forms of capitalism and just let it run amok, you know, let it just consume everything. And, you know, whatever you think about them or whatever you think their advantages might be. It, it's just, to me, it's like, um, it's like purified lie, right? You know, it is <laughs> completely untethered from reality any longer. You know, we can take things like an energy source um, such as coal and we burn it and we create electricity. Then we use that electricity and devices that are made out of rare earth minerals and their computer processors, and then they work on redundant math equations in order to create ethereal value that can do what? And, and it, it's like, we're, we're actually taking things from our planet that have real tangible use and value and finding ever more efficient ways to squander it. <laughs> man that that is a horrible vision and yet accurate <laughs> right and it's like 
how how are we not careening towards the hellscape here? I, like, I just don't get that. I'd like to add in that uh, in some quarters, there is a, a profound faith in artificial intelligence, AI, uh, with people suggesting, oh, we have artificial intelligences which are already becoming conscious. And I think it is just so aggressively on the wrong track that it, it makes me cringe and quail when I read people taking it seriously. Uh, it's, it's, I don't deny the power of advanced computing and the algorithms, the neural networks that they use. I mean, computers win at Go now, the game of Go, mm -hmm. which no one ever thought would happen. So we're clearly making these, we, they, uh, the people who do that are clearly making these incredible advances in their capability. But to substitute that in for a human sense of, as you say, conscience, uh, I would say love, compassion, etc., to substitute a faith in artificial intelligence for those qualities is, is, is monstrous. It's diabolical, and it can do nothing except lead to the worst kind of suffering and disaster. I, I absolutely agree with you. I, I mean, what is, how is that not building the wizard, you know, in Oz? That, that let's, and, and I mean, it also links with um, like data. Is it solving problems? Is it helping? Do things actually seem better? So, I mean, that effort to kind of build the new God and then to crown them to solve our problems. Um, I, I, I don't know how we think that that's going to go well. Y you know, it, it's like, like the computational power of any AI or any machines. Um, it just seems like, don't we really have that in like human minds and spirits with billions of people on the planet? And then that's many different perspectives and voices and you know locations and that just seems like a much more rich fuller understanding of the purpose and the direction that life should grow than any machine that we create um through like a limited number of people um could ever compare with well i agree i think an interesting question that comes up from this discussion is what is the source of the tiny spark in each of us, which when brought together in community can nurture life? Yeah, um, I, have, I have the answer. You, this oh. may surprise you. I actually know the answer to this one. Okay, go for it. Man, I, I cannot remember the, the, the writer. Um, and I'm going to, you know, of course, destroy the quote, right? But I think that it, it, the quote goes something like, um, the, the, the story of the history of the world is not the story of uh, good battling against a great evil. It is the story of a great evil seeking to eradicate um, the smallest drop of human kindness. But if what is human and humans has not been destroyed yet, evil will never conquer. I can't remember where that quote's from. <laughs> but I think that's it. It's kindness. It, it's that, um, you know, um, even like in the movie, like Schindler's List, it, it's, it's, there's always the option to be kind. Y you know, no matter how, mu how much I am part of some system of oppression or exploitation, I can always kind of fudge things to treat someone kinder, you know, to, to, to treat them as a fellow human being on this planet. And we always have that option. You know, it's with uh, all the controversy, controversy around police. Every policeman always has that as an option. You can never be forced completely to harm or to abuse other people. 
And so if you make the choice to be kind, I think that is the most powerful thing that we can do. Brilliant. On that powerful note, I would like to end for today. This is a fantastic discussion. Uh, I really, I think we're really finding some useful things here and I thank you. No, oh, I agree. Thank you for having me again. This is Andrew Constantino. I am David Baum. This is Collapse Club. Until we meet again, farewell. Bye.